is, we're talking about the future of Wi-Fi and beyond. Of course, we had to add the beyond. And that's, you know, just for Heather to see that she liked that. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's more about the beyond and it's how we got to where we are and, and kind of looking at the pace of where we're going to. So if you want to follow up and see me, you I've got a QR code there that you can check if you're if you're trusting. It, it actually just is a list of my uh, email and and addresses. But you know you never know when it comes to uh, QR codes. You got to be a little careful. Anyway, I do WLPC. I've been doing this for a couple of decades now. And oh yeah, I need to update my picture because I don't have brown hair anymore. This is my COVID hair. That's what happened. Okay, talking about. The, this is the Wi-Fi Alliance's rebranding of what we had in 8.11a, actually 8.11 Prime, A, B, G, N, A, C, etc. They changed the naming to Wi-Fi 4, 5, 6, 7. Uh, should be having eight coming up very soon. The names are a marketing term, not necessarily the, the actual piece that we're working with. So just remember, you need to be a little ambidextrous with uh, be able to switch in and out of 802.11 names and the Wi-Fi Alliance's numbering scheme. Well, the complexity that we're looking at is crazy hard. I'm going to give you some examples here of, of what I mean. So if we, if we look over here on the left, we had 97, we had 8.11 Prime, then we went to 99, in 99 we got two of them, A and B. And by the time we got to 2003, we got G and then N and then AC and AX and AX and BE. And Jim and I were discussing before we started the webinar, there's now 8.11BN, which will end up being Wi-Fi 8. At least that's, that's the plan. So the upgrade cycles have gone in, in kind of spurts there is this big, huge, long jump between 2003 when we were on G to N. We had a six-year gap. And during that six-year gap, a lot of things happened. We, prior to the 802.11 N, 802.11 was, was still viable and workable, and we used it for all sorts of things. But it had some, some pretty basic issues at the, at the PHY. Uh, we were limited on a lot of things. But it, it worked and we used it for a long time, it's fine. But it was a very large upgrade to go to N. Uh, and as, as Jim and I discussed earlier, it happened to be ratified on September 11th. Uh, you know, they could have picked any day, but they happened to pick 9-11. At least I remember it that way. And then we had four more years for AC and then another big, long six-year gap until we got to AX. The last two though are coming much, much quicker just two years. And in another two years, we'll have a, another update. Uh, we could have looked back at the AC time frame and said, well, there was actually a phase one and a phase two, kind of a wave one, a wave, wave two. And those were chances for vendors to sell you an upgrade. That's, I mean, yes, there's newer, faster, better chips, newer, faster, better protocols, but it's also a chance to to stay more current with your, the technology. A couple other things we can look at in the, um, on this one table, and by the way, like Heather said, you'll have access to this table and feel free to use it how, how you like. In the MCSS world, we only had two, well, actually it wasn't even called MCS back then, we just had two speeds, one and two meg. And then when we went to 807B, we had one, two, five, and a half, 11. And by the time we got to G, we added all, one, two, five, 11, plus the OFDM ones, which got us up to 54 meg. But when we jumped over here to 807N, we ended up with 77 choices. That's a big jump. Now, one of the things that that big jump gives us is the ability to have our Wi-Fi self-tune a little better. When you were only had four choices of speeds, if you couldn't do 11, you'd back off to five and a half. You couldn't do five and a half, you'd back off to two. And if that didn't work, you'd back off to one. And it was very um, chunky. Every step had really big stairs. Uh, and when it happened, you lost at least half. Every jump was at least half of your speed. And it was fairly noticeable from the end user standpoint as that happened. When we went to N, 
we picked up a whole bunch of new features. One was we got MCSs and then we got more spatial streams and we got all sorts of features. But the result was our, our process of staying current with my client, my client is a transmitter, my transmitter having more choices when it had its chance to transmit. If it didn't like one, it could try another one. It could say, say well, yeah, I'm not really good. I'm not getting my responses I want when I send it at 54 meg with two spatial streams and short guard interval. Maybe I should change channel width. Maybe I should change my guard interval. Maybe I should change my MCS. Maybe I should change my coding. And there was more little choices to be made by each transmitter, <clears throat> which allowed it to not jump so harshly. Now, depending on the algorithm that people used, it could have been super still harsh, but it allowed it for a, a more smoother change. We also had some huge changes in our speed from two meg to 46 gigabytes. Yeah, like we're gonna really get that. So. We had upgrade cycles. We've been we've been living through these for the last twenty years, twenty plus years. The complexity we have here. I just tried to get the most scary math picture I could find on a chalkboard. It's it's tough stuff out there. We're expected to understand what's going on, and yeah, I could wrap my head around eight or eleven classic one and two meg. There's only a couple of choices you had to learn. By the time we got to end, we had to learn lots more. It's getting more complex, but exponentially more complex. And, and we'll show that in a, in a little bit. So a couple of years ago, I put together this little chart to show how, you know, as, a, as a framework to hang on when you're doing troubleshooting of Wi-Fi. Broke it down into the things that are the wireless pieces, the parts that were blue were the local network and the green was the WAN stuff. And even inside the red part of the wireless, we had the RF medium had its own issues that were going on. And some of these have little circles around them, meaning they're constant processes. The MCS process is taking place every single frame. The contention process takes place every single frame. Everyone contends. The DFS process is listening every single time. The association happens every single time you associate. We're going to go through this entire process. So that's what the little circles mean. And this was just back a couple of years ago before we even had AX. It's even more complex now. So this was a, an attempt that I made to try to at least put things into categories. Where would you go look? What's going on for every single transaction, every single transmission? Where can we go to look to see if we can troubleshoot it? If we don't know where to look, it's really hard to troubleshoot. And a lot of Wi-Fi troubleshooting ended up being in the blue and the green, uh, but people always pointed to the red. So anyways, it was a, a, a framework we could use to do troubleshooting. Underlying this little graph, this graphic of this troubleshooting is really a whole bunch of little things. There's, uh, I think, 33 bubbles on the previous one, but there's over 300 individual metrics that are tied inside each one of those bubbles. So I turn this one is the bubbles are on the left, each of the bubbles, and on the right are the metrics we could use to look to see is, was there something actually going on in that bubble itself to find out what's wrong. Yeah, this is lots and lots of data. And again, this is what we had prior to the latest versions of 802.11. It's now even more complex than this. Now, this is still a useful, useful tool. Uh, feel free to print a copy out and put it by your desk and work through it so you understand the processes of how every single transact transmission over the RF medium has to go through all those processes. Okay, frequencies. We live or did here in the 2.4 gig range, then on this wireless land in the five, and I couldn't find an updated version that shows the six gig is also wireless, but it has been C-band and they're still uh, have preferential treatment because they're the, they've been there the longest. But there's a lot of frequencies that we can choose from. And we just have a little teeny chunk. But inside those chunks, we have our little piece. We have two, four five gig and six gig. And each of those categories has rules around it. Let me give you a couple of examples. If we go over here, the 2.4 gig channels, that is the formula 
2407 plus five times the channel number will give you the wavelength. We'll give, that's, we'll give you the actual center frequency. The wavelength itself changes depending on which frequency. And we understand that wavelength and frequency are linked together. Five gig has a different formula. Six gig has a different formula altogether. So every set of frequencies has more details in how we're even gonna access them and use them. So let's start at a simple thing. This is the physical, I'm not gonna say physical layer because you're gonna think RF. This is the actual physical size of each of those choices. So as we go to our customers and we're talking about their requirements and we're trying to solve the problem, we can solve it with different actual physical characteristics of the frequencies we choose. 2.4 gigahertz has a large receive aperture, meaning the antenna physically that's going to grab the energy out of the air is bigger physically than the five gig. So I hear some people, many people over the years have said something that is totally, absolutely false. Five gig doesn't go as far as two four. That is untrue. Like, I, I don't know how more, more to say it's untrue. If I had an, a, a 2 4 AP and a 5 gig AP, and they both transmit at the same time, they would both hit the moon at the exact same time. They go the same distance. If I put a receiver on Jupiter, they would have both hit Jupiter at the same time. 2 4 and 5 gig go the same distance every single time. The difference is all about the receive aperture. And the 5 gig receive aperture is smaller than the 2 4. So it receives less energy. It hits there just at the same, they travel the same speed, they go the same distance, but the receiver has less energy to work with. And so at the same RSSI, you would get a higher RSSI on 2.4 than you would 5 gig. That has nothing to do with how far the, the signal goes. It has everything to do with the receive aperture. In fact, there are some companies in the past that on their access point, they would put two a stacked dual five gig uh, antenna and have two of them together so that you would approximate the size of receive aperture of a two four to kind of get around that problem. Now at the bottom of this, you can see I added things like uh, the size physically, both in inches and, and metric, and then also the free space loss. Two four loses about 3940 dB at one meter. And 60 gig over here loses nearly 70, 67 dB. That is a huge difference between the two, which is why we have to treat them differently. It's not that they um, are good or bad. They're just different and they can achieve different things. The other answer that's tied to this is if you look at just the speed, 2.4 gigahertz, that means 2.4 billion times a second, this, it's going up and down. Well, we know that modulation is tied to how often the peaks and valleys happen. So if we have a 60 gigahertz or even just a six gigahertz, it's going up and down more times, meaning you can carry more data just by changing the frequency. So adding complexity onto complexity, we're just continuing down this little path at, that we've been following this evolution. So under 2.4, and this is just more of a resource for you, we use Wi-Fi, and Wi-Fi uses a certain type of 2.4. We put it in different channels. Our channels are wider, either 22 for 811B or 20 for everything else since then. And they're centered, and they have center frequencies, one, two, you know, and they overlap along the way. We also have Zigbee, 802.15.4, and it uses fewer channels, 16 with a two megahertz spacing, I'm sorry, two megahertz wide channel with five megahertz spacing, also in our same frequency. BLE, a little different, Bluetooth, even more. But again, all of them are sharing the same frequency that we're in. Now they've tried to design them so that they can play nice together, but realize this is just one set of frequencies we're dealing with. Under five gig, depending on where you live in the world uh, and when in time, because some of these things have changed, like the terminal Doppler weather radar uh, 
constriction we had in the US, the kind of yellow ones over in the middle of the five gig, we couldn't use them for a while, then we could use them for a while. If you go all the way in the far right, we couldn't use that for a long time, and now we can. Uh, we maybe can, depending on if we have a six gig and can our hardware put a, a uh, the ability to keep the six gig from hitting this five gig. Anyway, lots, lots of details to, to deal with. And then we moved on to six gig with tons more frequency, 1200 megahertz, and it even has more complex rules about standard power and low power. Anyway, that's that wasn't the reason I want to bring it up. Just wanted to show under frequencies, we have lots of choices and our choices got bigger and bigger along the way. I borrowed this, this graphic uh, from a marking site, but it's missing the most important bits. Yes, we can talk about 64 qualm. 64 qualm, yeah. What we really need to talk about is what about BPSK? and QPSK, and 16 qualm. Those are the downsides of Wi-Fi. We still can talk at that slower rate. And the crazy thing that I tell my customers when they get all like, we need newest, latest stuff is, if you have the sl absolute slowest rate possible in 802.11n, say Wi-Fi 4, you can still send HD Netflix videos. And that's at the worst possible rate. So we, we see these numbers chasing to go after faster and faster and faster, more bits, more symbols, uh, also with included more SNR in order to get it. But at, at what, what's the cost and how are we going to design around that? So old days, we had HT and VHT, and we had this fairly simple looking, I didn't put the whole 77 rows on here, but we had a bunch of MCSs we could choose from. And I've presented here before. And yeah, I, I love MCS. I think it's a, a wonderful way to troubleshoot and evaluate and look at what you're doing because it's how the clients transmit. It's how the APs transmit. They use this technique. But we, I wanted to show the simplicity of this one, which isn't terribly simple. But as we move from N and AC to extra details about AC, when we could do now... BPSK, QPSK, 16 QAM, 64 QAM, 256 QAM, we now had more choices to choose from. And this is only two spatial streams. If I showed you the whole four spatial streams, it gets more complex. And then we go to where we look today. And I'm not even going to zoom in because it, it won't even help. We have so many choices to deal with. Now, think of how you're learning this. And it feels a little frustrating as a human. We look at it and we think, oh, yeah, that's, 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 well, how, how, how can we comprehend that? And now just put yourself in the shoes of the person who has to write the algorithm for roaming, the algorithm for dynamic rate selection. Which do I choose? Of all of these possible choices, I now not only have to choose between spatial streams and 320 meg channels, 160s, 80s, 40s, 20s, guard intervals, coding schemes, modulation schemes, and I have to negotiate this with my receiver on the other end and talk, and I have no feedback loop between the two because all I do is transmit, and then I have to make a decision. I didn't get an ACK, so then what should I do? And that algorithm has to be dynamic and work all the time, or your clients are going to complain. Yes, complexity is moving up at a very rapid pace. So I'm going to go back just quickly to show you this upgrade cycle chart so I can reinforce something. Okay, ready? You got this? Lots of things changing, getting better, faster, more complex. Here is what the changes in the modulation and coding schemes just over the last 15 years have been. And those of you who are into math at all, kind of see this is an exponential curve. Pretty flat at the lung at the bottom, and then quickly getting faster and faster and faster. I don't even want to see what this looks like with Wi-Fi 8. It's just going to continue going on. So here we are as implementers of Wi-Fi. We know these things are happening. It's getting more complexity, more speed, more frequencies, more channels, more bandwidth, more, more, more of everything. And we're trying to solve problems for our end users, really for our customers, but the end result is the end users need the system to work. 
and we go, hmm, do they really need this? Or what, what is the thing that they actually, the end customer wants? If you're in a hotel, they want to be able to watch Netflix. So what is it going to take to give them Netflix? Adding to this, and I did an entire session with Seven Signal on this one concept, a single frame transmission for one single frame to transmit. And by the way, if you look on the right side, they're color coded to kind of match the, the graphic. But of everything on the right side, and we'll just see if Jim's listening here. Jim, which color is our data? Blue. What's everything else? Overhead. And they all take time. It's just a waste of time. So people get all excited about seeing really fast phi rates. And even while we move to Wi-Fi 7, it still has the backwards compatibility with all the rest of the colors that are not data. The graphics on the left, I'm not gonna go into the details of what they're saying, but it's showing that if you look at the bottom graph, if, if you changed just one feature, like, oh, I went from 20 megahertz channels to 80, that's a 4X improvement. Well, you can see the blue box on the top versus the blue box on the bottom. The blue box in the bottom got a lot faster. It didn't take very much time. We sent it really fast. But did we actually save any time? And time is the most precious thing we have when it comes to Wi-Fi. So just because we've been talking about all these things that have to do with fire rates, we didn't get rid of all of the overhead. It, we had a chance. And I've talked to a lot of people in industry who could have been there and changed this. But the backward compatibility group within the political structures of the Wi-Fi Alliance and the IEEE, they won. They, they just said, we're going to keep it that way. So even in six gig, when we had all this pristine new stuff, new frequencies, we're still luck, stuck back in this world. So what's the difference between the marketing and the reality? Two, four, five gig, then we went to five gig of Wi-Fi five. And you notice the Wi-Fi Alliance didn't even show three, two, one. In fact, it's not a thing. There isn't such a thing as Wi-Fi 3. There should have been, but if you started counting backwards, you would end up with a negative number, like Wi-Fi negative one. And so they didn't go that route. I think they really went to Wi-Fi 6 because they wanted it to sound better than 5G. And then we got stuck and we couldn't then go to 6 gig. So then 6 gig was just 6E because they didn't want to say seven. And with six, I mean, they kind of built themselves a hole marketing wise to pull this off. So how many of us go about doing real world testing of the features we're talking about here? Uh, not, yeah, it was last year in Prague, we had a presentation by someone showing how they had worked very hard and they built up from how do we prove BSS coloring works? And the pre presenter went through all of the things they had to do on their equipment. This was a, a vendor presenting on their gear to get BSS coloring prepared and shared and tested. And in a lab environment, when they were all done, <clears throat> they were able to turn on BSS coloring and get 10% improvement. Ooh. That's just one of the issues that we've been talking about. And it's a small issue. And does it really work? I've had a, uh, a challenge out to vendors. I would love to see a BSS coloring test with off-the-shelf clients with standard non-tuned network and just show BSS coloring working or MU-MIMO working or OFDMA working in a just normal environment. It's even hard today to still capture an OFDMA packet frame exchange and be able to decode it. So we've got all these features, the growth's going, the future's coming with even more stuff. And what have we really pulled off? Well, if you need more details, I'll just leave this. Oh, actually, you're going to get this tomorrow, so I don't need to leave it up. But you can go and watch these videos about Wi-Fi 7 and how y, uh, 6 gig is coming along and get more details. <clears throat> It's the future of wireless is what I titled this, not the future of Wi-Fi specifically. So Wi-Fi, CBRS, private LTE, Halo, LoRaN, 
there's all sorts of Wi-Fi, and then there's carrier cellular. And not meaning to sound like um, a Sesame Street character, one of these things is not like the other. And the difference is, what's the business model that's tied behind them? Okay, coming to a close here. I have a, um, a hotel I've been going to for probably 15 years. It's, uh, it's near a big airport that I've stayed at, and I, I usually stop there before I take an international flight, and I go in and uh, you know stay there just for a night before I'm going to catch a flight out. Pretty simple. Solved their Wi-Fi maybe 15 years ago because they had some really terrible problems like uh, APs with antennas that didn't have any antennas plugged in. Uh, it was, you know, we, we've seen a lot of those kind of bad flies. Uh, upgraded them to 802.11g at the time, put in antennas on their, on their access points and got it up and working. Happened to be by there last year and saw that it was still running 802.11g. And that's not even a Wi-Fi number. It's so old. And think that I'm going to, you know, perhaps get them to upgrade and I could pick another consulting gig to give them, you know, help them upgrade. So I get down on the front desk and say something. And the, the lady at the front desk says, oh, you must be a Wi-Fi guy. And I'm like, what? Well, you're a Wi-Fi guy, right? And I'm like, well, yeah. She goes, because I know nobody else complains about our Wi-Fi except for Wi-Fi guys. I'm like, what? Well, and, you know, I'm just like on my back feet. Here's this desk clerk, like chiding me for, what do you mean? She goes, everyone else loves it. They get their Netflix, they do their email, they do whatever they want. And then some Wi-Fi guys look at it and say, it's old, you should upgrade it. And they come down and talk to me about it. You're the only, I know you're a Wi-Fi guy because you're the only ones who ever say anything. Hmm, okay. Made me think about it for a little bit. I have customers today who are still running 802.11n. Now, that was 8.11g. I'm, I'm pretty sure it could be way improved with 8.11n. But depending on where you are, if you have a well-tuned Wi-Fi network that's delivering what you need and meeting your customer requirements, you're meeting your customer requirements. Just think about it. That is, is there a, a reason to upgrade? There are companies who have budget issues that we save money and then all, every five years we upgrade. Fine. I'm not against that at all. I'm saying, do you need to upgrade? What is your Wi-Fi today not doing that tomorrow's will do? And we all live in a world where we make our livings by helping people make better Wi-Fi. So there's nothing wrong with upgrading. I just want you to think, if what is the requirement and are you meeting the requirement today? So moving forward, down the path. <clears throat> do you need backward compatibility? You may. Many of us uh, have customers that have clients that definitely can't upgrade. Hopefully, um, fingers crossed here, that you don't have anybody that still needs a B or a G only device or something that's 2.4 only. But even if you do, you need that backward compatibility. Well, you can build that in. Do you need multi-user? And if so, do you need it up or down? And are your clients supported? Do you currently today or will you in the next rev need multi-gig on your switch fabric? Uh, switch vendors love selling it to you. If you were upgrading your switches today, I would say, why not? You know, get, get the latest and greatest stuff because you have to sit on your switches, I don't know, seven, 10 years before you replace them. So nothing wrong with putting in multi-gig. I just have yet to see a reason that the Wi-Fi was the reason you had to do that. Are you able to and you will need, if you're after these really, really fast qualms, do you have the ability to design to a, a 40 dB SNR? That's what the high level qualms need. And that may require a full redesign if your requirement needs the clients to connect at data rates that are required by 1024 qualm or 4096 qualm. That is a huge ask. That's a big lift to what we're doing. Now, this one for sure you will need better 802.11, sorry, 802.3 PoE. 
your PoE needs are getting stronger and stronger and stronger along the way. So you might not need a multi-gig switch, but you do need a switch that supports more PoE. And your PoE budgeting in your design should be something you're working at from the very beginning. Your power budget is critical. Yes, you can take an AP that has all these fancy features and put it with less PoE and it will work and it will downgrade, but you'll be troubleshooting trying to figure out why it's not doing X, Y, and Z when the real reason was you just didn't give enough power. Wi-Fi security moving forward. We need WPA3 as a requirement for anything in six gig. So as you move and you make those decisions to go into six gig, you will probably most likely end up with a two tier two tiers of security yes i know you can go through and do a transition mode but transition modes suck just put it out that way because what you're saying is i'm not going to use the new stuff i'm going to allow old stuff to be on there we had this problem 15 years ago when we moved from an older version of anyway that was a long time ago hopefully it's not repeated but we don't need to live in that transition mode because we end up getting stuck there. So you're going to have to think through what's that requirement. And if you're a, a site that uses EduRoam, yeah, I don't have any answers for you. Not yet. EduRoam requires a single SSID. And if you go to six gig, you, the SSID needs to be the same and that works. But now in six gig, you're required to have WPA3 on that SSID, which would mean you need WPA3 on your other SSIDs, and that could get a problematic. So uh, you might want to look at JG Manila's talk from the latest WLPC, and she does some good answers there. So here's my last bonus slide. And I'll just let it sit there and think for a minute. We live in a world we get paid and we work with and we think and we're using infrastructure all the time. We think about APs and cabling and wiring and coverage patterns, and yet it's really all about the clients. The clients are what drives everything. If you, you could be putting in a Wi-Fi, oh, in fact, someone sh is shipping a Wi-Fi 7 access point. Since there's no Wi-Fi 7 clients, I don't really understand the need, but, but people are pushing on the infrastructure side. That's where we live. But what we really should be focusing on, what are the client needs and focusing there? So if you can remember anything for this entire slide deck, just remember, Focus on the clients. That's what's going to drive the rest of your decisions. So questions. Let's see. Do you have any queued up for me, Jim? I wasn't able to. Yeah. yeah. Up. I think me and Chris are going to help you out here. And uh, thanks for presenting today. Always thought provoking and really interesting. So um, awesome job. Thanks so much. We're going to start with a question uh, from Forrest. Um, and we might get into some physics here. He, he asks. Why not make the five gigahertz receive aperture the same size as 2.4? So that's actual, not just physics, physical physics. The, the reason the aperture is that size that I showed on that graphic was because the wavelength of the, that frequency is that size. So normally what uh, an antenna designer will do is if the wavelength, let's just, just pick an easy one, is 12 centimeters long, they will design a quarter wave of that, three centimeters, and that's the size of an antenna. Since the wave's gonna go up, down, down, up, if you break it into quarters, you'll be able to pick up that wave fairly cleanly. Yes, you could have a full wave antenna, which is improvement on a quarter wave antenna, but at a cost of being much, much bigger. So they usually design in quarter wave antennas. The antenna for a five gigahertz antenna is physically smaller, the, the wave is. So you're, you physically have to make your antenna match the wavelength in order for it to, to listen and hear that frequency. If you had a 2.4 antenna, it will pick up some of the five gigahertz antenna, but it's not tuned at all for that. So you end up not having a very efficient antenna. Um, Jim Palmer does a, a, a deep dive at WLPC specifically about that. And we change antennas and you can see the effects of those. So your question was about why don't we do it? The reason we don't do it is because physics, five gigahertz radio waves are listened on a smaller antenna. 
which means they will always receive a small amount of RF energy. That makes sense. That get that one, Jim. I think so. Great yeah. job. Yeah. Uh, we'll pick one here from Andrew. It says, if you're designing for a future-proof Wi-Fi design uh, now, would you recommend Wi-Fi six, six E, or seven? And I have some, I have some thoughts of my own, but I'd like to hear what you think, Keith. Uh, I, I, I would want a really strong definition of what you mean by future-proofing. Yes. Um, <laughs> and so I've had some customers bring that exact question up, and they say, "We want to be future-proofed." And I say, "For how long?" And they say, "As long as possible." I go, "Okay." you should wait until Wi-Fi 10 comes out. And they're like, there is no Wi-Fi 10. Well, you, you wouldn't give me a deadline, so I'm giving you an infinity. And they're like, well, no, no, we, we want it for five years. Okay, I can answer a five-year question. I can answer a three-year question. So the first thing is you're going to have to put a time horizon on the future ability. You also need to, and, and this is where we have a lot of discussions when I go on-site with customers to do designs, is... I give them a list of, I, I use iPhones because it's an easy number and a lot of people have iPhones. And I say, do, you, do we need to support iPhone ones? And they usually go, what? And I have one. I actually have a big rounded and I show, well, this thing, oh, that's too old. Well, okay. I have a little iPhone four. How about this little one? Uh, yeah, maybe. And I'm like, well, if you want me to design for an iPhone 4, and there, I, can, I can look back in history and show every year there's a new iPhone, and I can have a table that shows every year what are the features that come with those new ones, and I can project that into the future if you'd like. And so if we want to go two or three years out, I'm pretty good at projecting what two years out an iPhone is going to look like, and do you want your current buy to support that iPhone two years from now? But it starts to get fuzzy at three or four or five years out. And so if you really want a five-year out thing, I have a really hard time designing for it. Because one, if we put in Wi-Fi 7 today, we're putting in Netgear. And I, <laughs> I doubt they want to put in Netgear in their enterprise. If your wife doing six gigahertz today, there are some vendors. And if your vendor is a, is a proponent of six gig today, then you can buy six gig gear. And you can design for the six gigahertz. Um, but what's your client base? And most people's client base today is so far behind the curve and yet they want to project something in the future. So we sit with them and do that historical iPhone to today. And right now we don't have a six gig iPhone. We do have a Mac and we do have an iPad. And most people are saying 2023, we're, we probably will get a, a six gig iPhone and 2024 for sure. So if, if you want to go that route and we can show charts of how long did it take for the five gig to ramp up until it was above 50% when we're going to start seeing some benefits, will the six gig iPhone that you want to support or your Dell laptop, whatever your, your client of choice is, when does it now support MU MIMO upstream downstream? Do you need that as a part of your requirement? So there's a lot of questions that go in. So it's a simple question. What do I recommend? What I recommend is, asking your customer lots and lots of questions. And Chris, Absolutely. what's your answer? Uh, you kind of nailed all of it. So <laughs> uh, very well summarized uh, for, for all of that, you know, definitely looking at the client side first, uh, you know, you can't design for something that's not there uh, and it's not in the environment. So you have to make a lot of assumptions on that. Um, you know, it really, for me, the, the biggest thing that you could kind of look at is the 6E part. If that's part of the design you're trying to accomplish and in incorporating the additional bandwidth uh, that 6 gigahertz provides, that may be a start to start putting, you know, some future plans of at least planning for the additional bandwidth and frequencies that you're going to be putting in your environment. But absolutely everything you said is, is spot on. Sometimes uh, customers also have financial requirements. We have budget this year. How do we deal with the budget? And I like to ask questions. Can you save budget for later? <laughs> I want to say probably I mean, not. Most of those sometimes the answer is no. <laughs> and if the answer is no, what can we spend this year that will prepare us for something in the future? So I would, I would suggest definitely work on your cable plant because, uh, and you can even go and test your current cable plant to see if it's multi-gig capable. You, you might have put in 5E, but it's actually, when you go and test it, uh, NetAlly has a tool called Lambert that you can put on two ends and you can prove that it's multi-gig capable today. So cable plant, 
switch ports, definitely PoE. Um, I don't know the density of where APs are going to go in the future, but I'm guessing it's going to go up because if we want those features that come with 1024 QAM, our APs have to physically be closer together. So do you have the cable plant to support that? Do you have the switches to support that? You can, what's your cost to, you know, I've been in hospitals where it's two grand to remove an AP and move it because of asbestos abatement. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're not going to move APs. And, and that's a part of the design question. I'd also now, probably add in... I'd actually add, add into that the uh, the uplinks because if you're doing multi gig at the switch, what is your uplinks from your from your switches back to your uh, aggregation and core? If you're supporting one gig only and you're putting in multi gig Ethernet, you know you're going to have to look at what your what your fiber uplinks are going to be and maybe upgrade those at the same time. Yeah, we yeah, had that problem at a certain a point. Lot. It's it's just deciding where the bottleneck's going to be, right? It's <laughs> Absolutely. Gonna be well, the IDF if, if uplinks you like, going to be if at you the like talking port. about bottlenecks. Yeah, there's a really good book. Um, called the goal. Um, it's it it's we study in MBA school and actually had it in, a, in an operations class as well, and the, it's kind of a storybook about um, this fictional character. But it, the idea is it's teaching how do you find a bottleneck and how do you fix bottlenecks. And anytime you fix one bottleneck, you didn't fix it; it just moved. Yeah. Bottlenecks just move from place to place. Mm -hmm. Tons of years ago, I used to work with compact servers and they had a, a, a bottleneck fix. You just added more RAM. <laughs> it didn't solve any bottleneck. It just made it feel like it went away. So like, oh, we're having trouble, throw more RAM at it. And, and we, today was like, oh, throw more, throw more up, uplink at it. Okay, it kind of makes it, that part go away, but did it fix anything else, so. Yeah. Uh, Joe in the chat says multi gig Wi Fi with 50 megabits per second internet circuit. So <laughs> <laughs> that's where we're headed. Kick the can down the road. Here's a related uh, design question, Keith, uh, from Marcus, who wants to know Would you design a six gigahertz Wi Fi network differently than five gigahertz? Or could you use the same mounting positions you already have? Yes, you can do both. Uh, you may get away with leaving all the APs in the same location and turning on six gig in the short term because you don't have a lot of six gig clients. So you can offset and just, you don't have a six gig capacity issue. And if, if your five gig was solved for capacity, you can leave your APs in the exact same location. The six gig will be uh, like an adjunct, just in addition to your five gig. It, then to fill the holes that it might not have because six gigs free space path loss is different than five gig, you can boost the signal up and you can go with louder APs in six gig. It doesn't solve a six gig capacity issue, but like you said, kick the can down the road. We don't have a lot of six gig clients, so we don't have that problem today. So it's a short-term fix that feels good in the, in the short term, but it could come back to bite you. At some point, you will need to redesign for the six gig size circles. At some point, you'll need to design for 1024 QAM circles if that's part of your requirement. If it's not part of your requirement, yeah, who cares? Um, the other issue with six gig is, again, PoE, you're gonna have to deal with that. Um, are we gonna have all of the OFDMA features? Are our clients gonna be start using those? And that might also require a design. I like taking a design of an old design that I know is working and I put little red circles around every AP on the map. Then I clean them all off and then I redesign and I just happen to use those red dots as, as targets. I try to design around that and that minimizes your cable cost. If you know you have, uh, I don't know, five meter service loops, I make a five meter service loop size circle so that I can put the new AP in anywhere in there. So using current cable plant is as as you in your future design is a good way to lower your cost. It it me doesn't mean you're only going to use those locations, but at least keeps the cost as low as possible. Yeah, and I think there's kind of a middle ground kind of brownfield approach where you know you can do some modeling and say this is where all my APs are now. If they were all six gigahertz, what would that look like, and what's the path mm -hmm. of least resistance, the fewest APs that I actually need to move around to 
get ideal six gigahertz coverage for capacity in the future. So it's not all or nothing, I think. That, that's a good technique if the requirements only changed a little bit. And sometimes requirements do only change slightly. But if they change, like we also need location. Right. And many times as they're making this big upgrade and uplift, they the requirements go, oh yeah, we need location tracking. We need this. We, we need BLE added on top. We, and so the I like starting with a greenfield design to meet those new requirements but more of a brownfield that I know where all the cable plant is. But your technique also is very valid. It depends on how many, how many uplifts you're trying to accomplish at the same time. Yeah, for sure. And Anders uh, has a good rule of thumb to think about in the chat. He says, uh, if you've backed down your five gigahertz radios, six dB or more, you're probably okay. Because then you mm -hmm. can... Turn up. Well, uh, you, Anders, I don't know if you more know headroom for the... six gigahertz uh, transmit power. Then, yeah, I, I, I see where he's going. Yeah, and Anders, I don't know if you know where this came from, but the rule of thumb what is actually in the Magna Carta from I don't know what 1066 after that happened. So it, it, it's been around for a long time, and it was a phys It was an actual rule that was codified in English law that said a man cannot beat his wife with a stick with a diameter greater than his thumb. So. I don't, I don't know if we like using rules of thumb because they're, they're, they're kind of a pain. Uh, there was another rule of thumb during the Vietnam War is the Viet Cong said, hold your thumb at an arm's length distance. And if the American helicopter is bigger, uh, shoot it. If it's smaller, don't shoot it. So wow. I, I'm full of all sorts of information <laughs> that no one needed to know. I think I'll call them heuristics from now on. <laughs> All right, Chris, you got one? Uh, I was looking through here. I didn't know if you had another one off the top of your head. I saw a couple of them come through. Well, I've got a quick one we can do. Marcus sure. also asks, is the sticky client problem addressed by Wi-Fi 6, 6E, or 7? No, it's not. It's actually probably <laughs> made worse because now we've got three different bands to make a, a incorrect roaming uh, decision about. So it's and, and who makes that decision? the clients always the clients now we can help influence it i had some uh k12 that i was doing design for and they wanted to make sure that every ipad is left to classroom always roamed well we can look up what ipad specs are for when they roam and so we removed all the aps from the hallways we redesigned with external antennas with directional antennas to make sure Every time that iPad dropped into the hallway, he had no signal above 72, which is going to trigger an iPad roam. Yay. We found a way to help make this happen. And then the school district decided to get um, Wi-Fi calling for all their teachers on their iPhones with no SIMs. So they didn't have cell phone, but they could use Wi-Fi calling. Okay. So as soon as the phone rings and the teacher picks up the call, where does she go to answer the call? In the hallway. In the hallway, and her phone dropped every single time. And we're like, yes, that's exactly what we designed it for. Well, can you fix it so the iPhone still can call in the hallway? Uh, yeah, it, it, was, it was well over a million dollars to fix a problem that they could have solved with a SIM that they put in a cart. And by the way, even after the million dollars, the iPads roam terribly after that. But they got free phones. They didn't have to pay for their SIMs. Hmm. Yeah, at, so, best, at best, there's that least capable, most important client that you can help along the way It's in its roaming journey. But can't solve it all for every client in the mix. And if you have, if you know exactly what the clients are, you can do all sorts of wonderful things for that client. Yeah. Well, I have, if you need to contact me, here's my slide. If I, I wrote an article a, oh, a couple months ago now that if you're interested and you want to present, this is how to present to a technical audience. It's a whole bunch of rules of presenting to a technical audience. And I probably broke half of them during this presentation, so don't hold me to it. But all rules, you should break them at certain times as well. But if you're interested, that's there as well.
Great. Awesome. Good stuff, everyone. Thank you very much, Keith. Um, great conversation, great chat. Um, thanks, Jim and Chris, for being part of it as always. And thanks to all of you for being here today. You know where to find us. Uh, same time, same place next week. We will see you then. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah.